As ethnographers, you guys bring qualitative data to bear on problems that most of the people here are looking at with quantitative data. Uh, how do you see the relationship between the two? Are they tackling different questions, or are they tackling the same questions from different angles? Well, that is a humongous question. Yes. <laughs> so, so let us just take a moment to absorb. Yes. Yeah, so, well, pretty much this is this is the center of like the, the interaction of everything that we love to do, which is bring yes. in the ethnographic work, which is what we call the thick data, with the big data, which is what you know most people here at Strata already are very familiar with. It just you know looking at patterns at a humongous scale. But what's interesting is that you know when you actually bring those two together, that's where the little the fascinating stuff happens. That's where the magic happens. Yes, and that's pretty much what we spend our time talking to organizations about. And the big thing is that yes, they these the two different methods are very different, but they're very complementary. Yes. But then they answer they are set up to answer different sets of questions. But the more important part is is that organizations tend to use one or the other very separately. Yes. And our work is all about bring it together. Right. And, and you know a lot of the a lot of the challenges that businesses are facing are such big questions that just qualitative or quantitative alone, or even qualitative and quantitative without some way of bridging the two yeah. of them, won't solve problems on that order. Yeah, because so, when we see like organizations doing they'll already do qual and quant. Right. It's like yeah. it's not that people aren't doing it, it's just they're in different silos, and like somebody's here and someone's in the basement. Usually, the data scientists get stuck in the you know analytics yeah, department. We, <laughs> we hear a lot from data scientists who got hired and sit in the corner somewhere running reports for other people and aren't brought close enough to the business to do what data science can do. I mean, data science is already a pretty complex and interdisciplinary discipline. You have to know a lot of stuff to do data science well, and it's not just about how to crunch numbers. So what we talk about doing is really bringing data science and qualitative research closer together and closer to the core business problem so they can work together to solve, again, yeah. problems so big and complex that one approach alone can't solve them. And I think, you know, it's really exciting because like the most data scientists that we speak to is that they're really happy to hear this message in the end because they've been brought in and they're expected to be this like magical unicorn, like coming in to save the business. On and a cloud of rainbows. Yeah, and, and somehow those rainbows don't come. And then this is like, why didn't you like put out these rainbows to save our business? But usually the data scientist, you know, she or he isn't enabled with the right kind of framework to integrate into the rest of the business, already existing research that the businesses are doing. So that's why we're really excited to be here to kind of talk about yes. the integration. So, academic sociology, my background and yours too, I think, yeah. come tackles questions that seem like they have kind of obvious answers, like uh, they, they aren't really obvious at all. It's a dead serious question in sociology to say, how do you know that you're supposed to wear pants in the morning? Yeah. So do you see this sort of naive approach playing off in the business field? You don't know what you're supposed to do until you actually start Going, you're interacting with people, right? And yeah. this is the key thing about sociology. One of my favorite sociologists is Irving Goffman, and he looks at symbolic interaction. And he's got like, you can't look at people as isolated humans who are making rational decisions. You actually have to look at the interaction that happens and all the nonverbal, all the kind of social norms and cues that happen. So if you're a sociologist, you know, or if you're someone who's going out, you don't wear pants, but then you get the cues, then you actually start feeling pressure and social norm to put those pants on, even if you don't want to wear pants. The same thing with data science is happening, is that data scientists are, com are coming in, they're expected to do a job, but the point is, is that no, no organization or no department can act in a rational, perfectly predictable way. And what happens is that then the data scientists get cues from the business life, like, oh, I'm supposed to produce all these expectations, and then you start getting these norms of like, well, the data science is supposed to rescue us, but these this narrative is actually harmful for data science in itself. Absolutely. Is that, that, Absolutely. Is that you see the data scientist as a unicorn isolated from, and when you actually don't integrate all of the, if you don't actually put the narrative out in public and say, here's the narrative that we're talking about. These are the norms that we built around the story of what data science can do. We just walk around strata right now. We were just, we were, as we were kind of grabbing food along to our, you know, literally chat with people. We weren't kind of grabbing food. We were literally grabbing food. And we were like, look at all the kind of billboards and the ads, right? It's like, this will save this, this will do this for your business. And once you do this, you will have 100% uptime and your business will be done. And yeah, like, will be your business perfect. is never done, yeah. it's never perfect. And that's that, but, but the thing is like, I think the benefit of sociology is like, why don't we lay out the narrative, what are the claims we're making, and what are these expectations so that now we can actually solve real business problems. Let's stop making claims or like superficial narratives, but let's actually say, hey data science, how do we integrate you into the rest of the business? And to go back to our 
pants question. Clearly yes, the most important the most important issue here on the matter of pants. You don't really know per the conversation you just had whether you're supposed to wear pants until you go outside. You can be sitting in front of your computer with no pants on, doing a ton of research, doing a ton of analysis, but you discover context about the world around you when you actually go forth into the world around you and see what's happening. One of the things that thick data and that ethnographic methodology can bring to big data is a chance to see people interacting with each other as they are rather than starting from, here's what the business wants me to tell them, so here's how I'm going to construct our data collection and our data analysis so my boss won't be mad at me. It starts from other people's perspectives. You have to actually challenge your own assumptions. If your assumption is, I don't have to wear pants, then going out into the world will disabuse you of that assumption much more quickly than doing a Google search for whether or not you should wear pants. For most people. For most people. <laughs> Most of us hopefully aren't Google searching whether or maybe, not. Maybe there's some rebels out there who really want to be pantsless, and that's cool too. That's cool too, right. <laughs> no judgments. So the thing that uh, has come up a lot, you've heard it, I've seen it two or three times in talks, is that um, with bigger data, you don't need very good algorithms. And this has also been phrased as the more data you have, the less you need theory. So what kinds of, what important lessons from social theory do you think that data scientists should know to improve their work? I think, I mean, I think the, the biggest lesson for me, and, and you have a much more robust background in social theory than I do, but having interacted and participated and been in a lot of organizations that involve data science and other kinds of research, it's all about communication. That's the piece that we see over and over again, that it's not about necessarily the technical quality of the algorithms. And so far as, I mean, we're in an exhibition hall where there are, it feels like billions of exhibitors doing technological things that are in entirely next level. The technology around big data is incredibly robust. Big data doesn't have a lot of technology problems. The capacity has, I think, in a lot of ways outpaced what businesses actually know to do with big data. So the piece that's most interesting in a lot of ways is the communication piece. Is if you look at organizations that have big data capacity, that even might have thick data capacity as well, but don't have that kind of rigorous framework for communication, that don't have their own theory, that don't have their own methodology for actually communicating across silos, it really limits what big data can do regardless of the quality of the algorithm. And I would argue that it is completely ridiculous if any business is going to say, oh, you know, now that we've got all this great data, we don't have to improve our algorithm. To me, that is the quickest way to tank your business because data collection should be iterative it should be responsive to how the real world is changing. And so you actually need to go out into the world. You may have built a perfect like you know, data algorithm collecting set, right? You may have the perfect variables, but the real world is changing. So if you have something new that's happening, you know, in the marketplace that is not you're not responsive to, and then saying, okay, we know that people are now doing this, they're now eating this, or they're now buying this, or the market this something just happened in the economy. How does that if you're not asking, how does that change our algorithms? How does that change our assumptions for what variables that we have chosen to measure? Then you are going to be screwed. And I think that like that is not that is not a good thing. But I think that is that's why you have to look at data collection as an iterative process. Absolutely. So I mean, it's agile, and that's why you have to learn. You know, we've learned from agile software development. We built our research, you know, sprint-driven process that you know, our research cycles, we don't ever outline anything ahead of time. We never say we have the perfect research model. We always say, we know what question we're asking for this sprint. Once we finish the work, then we're going to ask, them, what's the new what's new hypothesis we need to test? Do we now need to do a qual or quant immersion? And then we have it, to, as our research question change, and then we do another sprint. There's no, no such thing as done. And this is something we've learned from the tech industry itself. Absolutely, and, and I think this, this also leads us back to the pants question again. You know, the, the advantage of a naive approach, what makes an algorithm good, is a very important naive question. Yes. At what point is an algorithm successful? If you can successfully model your entire customer base into categories that still miss a huge trend that's a year out, have you built the perfect algorithm or have you built the worst possible algorithm? Because you're now so comfortable in your understanding of the way things are right now right. that you've actually given yourself an enormous competitive disadvantage. That is much more eloquently more stated than when I said your business is screwed. But I, I, do, I do have one point to add on to, to a, a real example, is that algorithms can also reify your assumptions and they can actually create a false understanding of the world. You know, So like Google has a really great search algorithm, but if you type in Google search, 
if you look type in white male or ca ca caucasian male or if you and then if you type asian female you're going to get two very different search results the algorithm is great but you have to look at what are the real examples when you type in you know caucasian female you get images of women wearing executive like outfits if you type in you know uh, Asian female, you get women spreading their legs because you have images of you know Asian women being exoticized as porn stars or as male-end brides. These are algorithms that are supposedly you know unbiased, but they can create they can they contain assumptions that you know can serve yeah. we can surface. Well, this is the thing: data comes from people, and people are messy and biased. So you can't scrub the bias from a data set by turning it into a data set. You can't look at that exact data set and say, well, I guess that means that Caucasian women look like this and Asian women look like this because it's in the data set and our algorithm is perfect. In terms of what the algorithm sets out to do, what the algorithm is looking to do as Google's algorithm is, is determining content which many people are linking to and seeing in their own imperfect human worldviews as authoritative when the algorithm could be entirely successful technically, but entirely destructive and awful from a sociological perspective. And this is, you know, not, we can actually bring this back to businesses, and we're seeing this in our client work all the time, right? So we don't just want to talk about pants and sex. But, you know, when it comes to our clients is that we're seeing that when we do the qualitative work, it actually, we get people asking us, like, we have a data set, we have certain things we, are, we already know we want to look at, but we don't know what we don't already know. Like, what questions should we be asking, right? What columns, what variables should we be looking at? So then we'll go say, why don't we do a qualitative sprint? And then the things that we find then can point you to new things to look at, which is a topic, you know, in our talk today of why big data needs big data. And that's something we hear from so many data scientists, that data scientists are brought in very far downstream. They're given a data set which is collected with a certain bias or a certain worldview from a company that wants things to work out a certain way. And by the time they see that data, it's already made its decision. There's no algorithm you can apply to unbiased, biased data, and all you have is biased data. So one of the things we keep hearing, and one of the reasons that we're so passionate about bringing the work we do to the data science community, and so passionate about listening to the data science community and hearing from people, you know, data scientists are people too. Data scientists are not machines who sit down and extract perfect nuggets of wisdom from any data They're set. They're not unicorn machines. They're not unicorn machines. They're, they do not ride on mechanized dinosaur rainbows to solve <laughs> Alas. magical business problems. They're people and they're really smart people. So a lot of this is about helping people leverage their own perceptions, helping people use their humanity to discover the humanity in the data they work with. Yeah, we're, we're really saying that you can be empathetic to all kinds of data, not just qualitative, but yep. you can come to quantitative data with an open set of eyes, and that you can bring empathy to that, and that's that's a way to unite. But you need to know what you're trying to do. Yeah. I think that's sort of the that key, is, that's that the missing piece. Yes, is that, that is I mean, this, and yeah, there's just a big New York Times article. Right. But yeah. there was a big New York Times article about this recently, right? That you can't, yeah. and there was a quote in there that said something like, you can't just run an algorithm over a raw data set and get inside out yes. of it. But in order to get that raw data set to a structured data set, you have to lose some resolution. You have to make decisions about what's important and what's not important. And if a data scientist doesn't know what's important and what's not important to a business, how can they expect it, yeah. be expected to make that kind of decision on the order of the data? It just it you still doesn't need to make know, sense. You still need to know how to ask good questions. Yes. No yes. algorithm or data is going to teach you how to ask the best question for what the business needs. And in this kind of economy where the world is like, you have all these different variables constantly changing, the questions are constantly changing also. So, wrapping up, yes. <laughs> real quickly, sure. as professional observers, yes. what have you? What strikes you about the conference here and the data science community right here? Well, now? first is that everyone is wearing pants here, and we think that's really commendable. <laughs> Very good. This is a plus. <laughs> They weren't last week. It was Comic Con. Uh, last week. Oh okay. yes, that, that's why true. Did, why don't we get invited to that? Yeah, seriously. People would love to speak of that one. Come on. Data science cosplay. I don't yeah. even know what that would look like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing, one thing we've seen because we interact with the data science community a lot here and outside of here yeah. is just the people working in quantitative data are really capable of doing qualitative work 
too. I think yes, there's a I stereotype sometimes yeah. that you know people who work in, in statistics, people who work in machine learning, are not perhaps the most socially adept people. Right. That they only are comfortable working with computers, not with people. But we see so many people who got into data science because they care about people, because yeah. they're passionate about big issues. They want to see how they can affect the most change in the world by understanding a huge data set. And that's something that's so important and it's so encouraging and heartening and awesome to talk to people who are practitioners yes. of data science and, and hear about their passion. And also, like, I think this is a, this is a stereotype that oftentimes data scientists uh, reify themselves because they're like, well, I work with numbers, so you know, I don't know if I can talk to people. But once you actually put them in a room and give them some uh, guidance and then get them out into the real world, they're actually really good at it. Yes. So oftentimes, it's not just about a stereotype, but it's something. It's like making them feel that they're enabled to do that and to quickly bring the qualitative insights back into their own work. And setting expectations such that they yeah. are given the room to do that yeah. and that the value of that is acknowledged by the organizations they yeah. work with. That if data scientists are coming into an organization, those organizations recognize that it's important for data scientists to talk to people throughout the organization. It's important for them to have serious face-to-face -face time with people because what they learn from those people is going to largely structure how they work with that data. It's going to influence their bottom line. Like yes. It's going to influence your yes. ability to influence the bottom line. Because all the business cares about at the end of the day is, can you speak to the bottom line? But we're saying, to speak to the bottom line, you actually have to speak to people. And you have to integrate that with whatever data that you got. That already came from people. By then, it's already been normalized and scrubbed of people's faces. But you do actually have to combine those two things. Um, and your other question that I have to say is that like, what's really exciting about this year is Strata, and I noticed a humongous difference, is that there is such a hunger for people to tie data science back to the business. Yes. I have to say yes, that, like, yes, 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 that yes. it's not something that was really, really like as like like loud, you know, in the previous years, but increasingly it's becoming so. Especially this year, is that not just by looking at the number of suits that you see, you know, <laughs> in the space and non tech shirts, is that but you actually see people from the business coming in, and I think that we are at a nexus, at an inflection point. Where data, where data scientists are like, right, we want to speak to the business, and the businesses are like, right, we want to step up our responsibility. Yes. That we can't just hire data scientists and expect them to produce magic. It's no, no more magic unicorns, machine robotic unicorns, but we want them to actually, we need to actually work together. It's not just a hiring and handoff and you have your own budget. It's about, okay, I need to do a better job of also understanding the language of data yes. science. Yes. I may yes. not be a data practitioner. I may not know how to run Hadoop and install uh, you know, all these things on my, on my server or even have a server, but I need to be in these rooms. I need to figure out which conversations I need to be a part of so I can be responsible or bring this back to my business and in partnership with data science. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, talking to people is what you guys do, and it's been great talking to you guys. Thanks great so much. Great talking to you, great talking Thank you to so you much. Too.